oh, this team sucks. Okay. The talent doesn't suck, just the way they're playing sucks. The way they're being coached sucks. This is a team that has no business being this bad. This is a team who is, for the second time this season, on a three-game losing streak. This is a team who had a very cupcake start to the season and, and have now lost seven out of ten games. Now, you can't put it all on the coaching staff. You have a lot of big-dollar players simply playing well, well beneath their level and anything that they should be playing. So as much as you might want to say, hey, that's all on the coaches, it's not. It's not. Not entirely. Like, and a good part of it is, sure, but you have to have some more perspective about it, and you have to hold everybody accountable and not just point the finger at a single scapegoat because then you're just being dishonest about it. This is a team who is leading the league in drops, missed tackles, missed field goals, and yet we're trying to say it's all Garrett. Don't get me wrong, I want Garrett gone. I've been done with Garrett for a long time. I'm done with the dude. I think at this point, I don't even bother waiting. I know we're still in first somehow because our division sucks this year. I don't think we have any business being in the playoffs, but we might still be able to get our foot in the door. And hey, because we won our division, we would probably host at this point the freaking San Francisco 49ers and get our just heads kicked in at home. Wouldn't that be great? Not really, because with this team, we haven't beaten a single team with a winning record this year. Our stats are abysmal. Our points per game, points allowed, all that are abysmal when you go against teams with an above 500 record and even on that front we couldn't even do it right against the Jets who we still found a way to lose to and they are the freaking Jets and are awful in their own right this is from uh, John Owning on Twitter Josh Allen Jeff Driscoll and Mitch Trubisky combined to go 57 of 81 against Dallas that is a 70.4 percent completion percentage for 684 yards six touchdowns and just one interception that being Trubisky uh, they added another 28 carries for 157 yards and three touchdowns on the ground. That is what you're doing. That is what your defense, your vaunted defense that said that it wanted to be the best in the league, one of the elite defenses of the league, and instead they're playing like utter trash. Oh, damn. Pretty much because there is nothing working on this defense. The missed tackles are atrocious at this point you've gotten great years out of Robert Quinn uh, I think Michael Bennett even though his impact hasn't been anything like what I thought it would be I think he's also still been a good leader in this locker room because he seems to be the only guy on the defense that really cares that the team is struggling he's in disbelief because he's like I'm playing within a scheme I've played before for a coach I've played for before, but something about the culture isn't right here. I don't know if it's that too many guys have gotten paid at this point, and so they've kind of taken a step back and slacked off a little bit. I don't know. Their backs were completely against the wall last year before they turned it on and got going. They were 3-5 and five before the Amari Cooper trade, lost the first game with Cooper. Um, no, that put them at 3-5, and five. excuse me. 3-5. and five. Then got rolling, lost only one more game in the regular season, that being a blowout loss in Indianapolis. But it's just not a good look for this team to be this this talented and playing this pitifully. And while we can say, hey, part of that is on the coach, right? It, it is the culture of the team. It is the leadership and the preparation. That's all related to the coaching staff. I understand that, but you also have, this, is, this isn't this is high school or even college. This is, you gotta be a leader of men at this point. You, like, you have to be able to have some semblance of control over the team, yes, but you also have to have leaders who play the right way, who focus and who give everything they have in these games. I don't doubt that the team is working hard. They're just not doing the little things they need to do to get over the hump. So in this game, Cowboys just completely shit the bed again. This is uh this is not a fun video I like doing on here, but you know what? I got to talk about the game. So, Cowboys in it. Dak, uh, his third or fourth straight very subpar game. I think he's had a brilliant season. He'll be he'll probably be a Pro Bowler, but twenty seven of forty nine for three hundred thirty four yards, one touchdown, no interceptions, was sacked once. I'll give him this: the touchdown pass he threw to Amari Cooper 
was just a picture perfect pass. A uh, difficult pass to throw, just drops it right in over the shoulder. Very well contested by the Bears uh, defensive back there. And it didn't matter because it was in the last ditch charge. I know the score was 31 24. It wasn't that close. Chicago dominated this game after they got going. And Dallas scores a couple times late to make it look a little bit better. But yeah, it, it sucks in this case. So Dak, not a great game. Not the kind of game you need out of your franchise guy. He'll probably get, ironically then, franchised this coming season instead of getting a big money deal. We'll see. We'll see what a new coach can do with him because there is zero way, zero chance you could bring back Jason Garrett at this point with this crop of guys and expect anything different. Zeke. Ran the ball fairly well, 19 for 81. It's 4.3 in average. That's pretty much league average. Now, he did have two touchdowns. He was the only part really working in the offense. Cooper, uh, 6 for 83 in a touchdown I mentioned earlier. Gallup, 6 for 109. A little bit of a quiet 109, but he got going late. Um, mm, th this season's going to boil down to that game in Philadelphia. You got the Rams this week. Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head who Philadelphia has, but... You got the Rams this week, and then you're going to, from there, have to go to Philadelphia. That'll decide the division. I don't think Week 17 is going to matter, but the way this team is playing, I honestly am not even sure if they're going to win another game this year. And yeah, you could say, hey, well, that helps with the draft stock, right? Sure, but there, there's nothing here. We've heard that it's going to take a an NFC Championship game appearance for Jason Garrett to save his job. This team's not getting anywhere near that this team is garbage and i and i was so so frustrated this past week before the game all the people you heard on sports radio and you saw some people writing about it as well basically saying hey you know the giants won the super bowl in like 2012 or whatever with a nine and seven record oh uh, uh, hey this team this team could do it they're better we know they're better than their record says they are but they're not and the fact that that's happened once in NFL history and you just make the assumption then, hey, our team can do it. Why? Based on what? What have you seen that tells you this team can get over the hump? Now, they're not losing in blowouts in these games. Oh, wait, except in the first half where they are. The Cowboys in the last three games have not scored a touchdown in the second or third quarter. That is abysmal. They have completely short-circuited. It's a failure at every level. It's a failure in Jason Garrett's game management. It's a failure in Kellen Moore's play calling. It's a failure in Chris Richard's secondary and defensive calling. It's a failure with the defensive front and Rod Marinelli. Like, it is a failure across the board with this team. And that's why, like, even if they could limp into the playoffs, they don't deserve to be anywhere near it. They're not deserving. They're there by luck that their division is trash this year because whoever wins the division might do it at 7-9 and nine at this point. That's, that's where we are with the NFC East. The Giants are out. I don't know if the Redskins are officially out yet. They'll be out this weekend, obviously, as I record this on a Sunday afternoon. And it, it's going to be Cowboys or Eagles, obviously, who can do anything at this point. One of them's going to have to advance by default, and that team's going to get waxed in the first round and uh, it's not going to matter because, hey, we could still go to the playoffs for back-to-back -back years. Whoop-de-doo! What does it all mean, Basil? That's all we're hanging our hat on at this point, huh? That's how low our bar is. Just, oh, playoffs. Doesn't matter if we're actually competing. Doesn't matter if we're actually contending for anything. We're only paying the most money of any team in the league for our offensive line to get good, not great play. We're only paying... Primo Dollar, biggest running back contract in NFL history to Ezekiel Elliott, only to get subpar play. What is he, like 6th or 7th in the league in rushing? He's been held under 100 yards for like four games now, like in a row. Like he's not impacting the games like we need. And I understand part of that is that we got pass heavy there for a little bit. And it's frustrating. There, there's nothing you can point to at this team. I can't point to a single person on this team other than maybe – Robert Quinn, and even he's kind of gone quiet in the last few weeks, um, who I can look at and say, you, you have been phenomenal for us this season. Dak, very good out of the gates, very good in the middle part of the season, but he's been fading now. He's been fading in the past three weeks, I think. 
Uh, Cooper, I know he's battling a lot of injury. I don't want to put anything on him. But at some point, we do have to have a discussion about how he performs on the road versus at home. If he played every game at AT AT&T Stadium, dude would be breaking NFL records with his production. But alas, because he has to go on the road, his numbers there are basically the production of a standard number two receiver, which is what he always was perceived as before he arrived in Dallas and suddenly exploded onto the scene. I know he's a pro bowler twice in Oakland before. He'll be a pro bowler again this year. I get it. I'm just saying in general, he was perceived as a number two receiver. He came here. People, That's why people were up in arms saying, oh, he gave up a number one for a number two receiver. Are you insane? Well, obviously not. It's worked out for us. But on the road, he still looks like a number two receiver. And we don't have anybody to, to make up for that production. Michael Gallup's a very nice wide receiver. Great wide receiver, too. I don't know if he can be a wide receiver one, but if he can be, it's going to take some time. It's just where the state of things are with this team. I don't know how to fix it. And depending on who you talk to, it either can't be fixed at all right now, like until the offseason, or it's just a move away. I don't think firing Garrett... You might get a little bit of a lift, but I don't know who on the coaching staff you point to, as I mentioned earlier, and say, hey, you are deserving of being the interim head coach here. Do you throw a curveball and say John Kitna? He is the only name in the coaching staff we haven't found a perfect reason to drag him over the coals for. This is uh, Ed Werder on Twitter. On a Doomsday podcast episode last year, uh, this is what Troy Aikman had to say about running a team. Would that be something I think I'd be interested in? The answer is yes. And, and I'll, I'd take it a step further. I think I'd be very good at it. Interesting. We've we've known about Troy Aikman's interest in running a team. The problem is Jerry wants to be the GM as well. He doesn't just want to be the owner. He's won twice in the past the Executive of the Year Award. And I think because of that, now he's like, well, it's not me. I'm not the problem. Although as Jerry is referenced as, you know, I know he's had angry interviews in the past week, you know, talking about the debacle that is this team that people said were, you know, admittedly, nationally, people thought this was an 8-8 eight and eight team. And I didn't see it. Maybe I was too close, like a lot of the people here were too close. I saw this as a 10-6, and 11-5 team, and I thought this was a about as deep and complete of a team as you could have in the league. And uh, I look stupid saying that. That's, hey, that's a bad take, bro, on me. I, I acknowledge that. I own that. But... Uh, Jerry doesn't Jerry doesn't get it. He can be angry and he can say, hey, Garrett and his personnel decisions and his performance reflects badly on me. Fine, but Jerry's not going to fire himself as GM. And that's why even when Troy made those comments last year, it, it was something that Jerry was just like, oh, yeah, that's cool. He didn't entertain it. He's not interested in that. He's not interested in handing over that kind of power. And in the in the game booth, the Thursday night football booth, Troy was asking, basically asked about this team when it was just completely falling off the rails in that second half. What do you do at this point? Like, what what do you tell the team if you're the coaching staff? How do you fix this? And on one hand, Troy says, you know, I, I don't know who is deserving on this coaching staff for being the interim head coach. Nobody has met expectations, least of all surpassed them at this point. But if you have to be, if it is just Jason Garrett for the rest of the year and you go into that room on Monday, what do you say? Troy's Casey basically said, I basically go in there and say, look, I don't know at this point. Figure it out yourselves. I've told you everything. I've done everything I know to do. It's on you. And while on one hand you look at that and say, that sounds like piss poor coaching basically admitting defeat. Like, I don't know, bro. At the same time, there is a kernel of truth to it, especially with uh, grown ass men in the room. You're going to have something where it really is a it's a shock to the system, especially I can't envision Jason Garrett saying something like that. But if he did, it would be a shock to the system, I think, from his usual robotics of his answers and his uh, all three phases and all that generic talk, all that, uh, you know, cliche platitude crap that he spews. It would be refreshing. And at the same time, it would challenge them and challenge uh, their direct pride in that regard as well. So I don't know. If it would do anything, if it would do anything to revitalize this team or focus this team, but that's the point we're at. We're at the point where it's like, okay, you got three games left. I could see you not winning another game, or I could see you winning at least a couple, limping into the playoffs and getting just shellacked in the first round by the visiting either Seahawks 
or 49ers. They got one more left. Seahawks got the first game, but they got the same record. So we'll see how that shakes out. Um, that's that's what you're looking at. And neither matchup looks very good for us. How? Back to the Bears game. How you keep Brett Maher, I don't know. We've I, I talked in the preseason when they made it clear that they weren't going to have a kicking competition. I said, Brett Maher is going to cost this team at least a couple wins. And he is. When the Cowboys finally had a chance at clawing back into this game against the Bears, Brett Maher shot them in the foot. First of all, he misses a field, another field goal that they needed at a point that was critical in the game. Then, when the Cowboys finally do score a touchdown, and it's like, okay, maybe. This is their last-ditch effort here to claw back into this game at the end of the third quarter, uh, start of the fourth quarter, and, oh, look at that. Brett Maher kicks it out of bounds. Huh. And then after the game, what does Maher say? Oh, you know, I, I think I did. I think I stayed in my own lane pretty well. I think I kicked the ball, hit it pretty well, and uh, I'm going to sleep with my head on my pillow nicely tonight. What? Dude, you played like trash. What what did you do in the game that was that was like bare minimum expectation? That wasn't a disaster for us. You did nothing. I mean, it shit, if we had anybody to throw out there, I would say, you know what? Th this is Brett Maher. That's what I want to do with Brett Maher on this team. I want to cut him right now because the dude's got nothing for us. Ooh, he can make an occasional 60-plus yard field goal. Hey, that's great. He's got a strong leg. But if he can't kick between 30 and 40 worth of damn, then what does it matter? What is it the Ravens kicker, uh, Tuck? What did they say? He's made something like 40 kicks in a row between 30 and 40 yards? Are you serious? That is the GOAT right there. And I say that as a guy who loved Dan Bailey, but Dan Bailey never did anything like that. Dan Bailey was phenomenal for us. He's great again this year. Go figure. He had one down year. I get it. It would have hurt us last year. What, what, what was a good season for the Cowboys. But now he's off elsewhere, still being a very good kicker. And we got freaking Maher who can't kick between 30 and 40 to save his life with any consistency. This team, the way it evaluated everything at every level felt flawed. They didn't even humor a kicking competition in camp. Oh, they ran bodies in so Maher wouldn't have to do every single kick in every single game and every single practice. Fine. But it was never an honest kicking competition. Oh, we ran three guys in in last week before this Bears game to, you know, get a competition going that way. Did you did you hear anything about them? Did you hear anything about the competition? No. Because it's not there's not a lot of good kickers sitting out there anyway. So yeah, against other scrubs who are on the streets at this point, I'm sure Maher looked okay. It's it's mind boggling how you can make that decision and then stand by it and stand by it and stand by it and stand by it. I said earlier I didn't see Jason Garrett being the kind of guy that could go out there and say, Hey team, I don't know what it's gonna take at this point to get it right. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Figure it out yourselves. I'm at a loss. I can't see him doing that because doing that, admitting that would be a betrayal of everything he's ever said or stood for. And I genuinely do believe he stands for that. The problem is for a guy who's talked so much about the process, the process of everything, he is so incapable of taking a look at himself and at his team and determining is the process working in 10 years as our head coach three years as our offensive coordinator before that have you ever gotten anywhere meaningful you've never gotten past the divisional round ever you have made flawed personnel decisions you talk about all three phases we've been the worst special teams unit bottom five for like five years running we haven't had a decent return man since who was it like uh Dwayne I can't remember he went to freaking uh he's with the Raiders now I think he was with the Giants for a while Dwayne Harris Dwayne Harris out of East Carolina that was the last time you had a good kick return man you bring in all these other guys, but you're not making it happen because you're not addressing it. You're not getting a quality special teams coach. You're not getting quality special teams players, and you're just not executing. 
Like, you look at New England, that game was decided because of special teams. And I know that's the first time when people really started looking at just how bad, how long Dallas has been in that situation with its special teams of its own. But New England has Slater, who is a beast in that regard. They understand, hey, this guy's a perennial pro bowler. He only plays special teams for us. He stays in his lane. He knows his role, and he impacts games. That is taking consideration. That is talking about all three phases and standing by it, understanding that there is a third critical phase not to be ignored. He does it. Belichick does it. Garrett does not. Garrett just gives you lip service to that regard. This team isn't going to go anywhere, any further under Jason Garrett. And as we sit here and we talk about all the different possibilities, like, uh, oh, what about uh, for a new head coach? What about OU's Lincoln Riley? Ha! I don't see Lincoln Riley coming to Dallas. I just don't. Wow, that animation went longer than I thought it would. I don't see it happening. Like, he hasn't been in Oklahoma very long. He's very, very well compensated. Oh, but I hear you say Jerry Jones has pretty much bottomless pockets. That's nice, but we don't pay big money to our head coaches. Do we have the... Uh, that, that's why it's frustrating, too. With our coaching staff, there is no salary cap on the coaches. You can pay the coaches however damn much money you want to pay them. Jerry could money whip every single quality coaching candidate, coordinator candidate, whatever he wanted, and actually build a legit team, but he doesn't do it. He doesn't go about it that way because he wants to stay. He doesn't want to look like he's overspending, I guess, in that regard. He's not going to money whip Lincoln Riley to get him away from Oklahoma this soon. Lincoln Riley's going to his, what, third straight college football playoff. He went to one previously. He's been to four college football playoffs in like seven years, six years of the thing existing. Now, you could make the argument for him as well. Hey, he hasn't gotten past the first round of the playoff either. Well, he hasn't had a defense to save his life. I think they have. I'm not getting off into OU talk right now. I think they got a defensive coordinator that could be good for them and who has made as I go into OU talk, has made definite strides. But the point is, Lincoln Riley would have to cede so much control to Jerry Jones. And, you know, we talk about it. Garrett Garrett has been a bit of a puppet for this team. He doesn't really have the authority to make these kind of changes. Parcells came in and had that in his contract, that he had personnel decisions. And that's part of why the T.O. thing rubbed him so wrong. He was so against bringing in Terrell Owens that... Uh, Jerry doing that undermined him in, in his view. And that's why he wouldn't call Terrell Owens his name. He wouldn't call him by name. He called him the player. So he had all the call and all the final say over his coaching staff. And that was allowed to stand up, but not with personnel decisions. Jason Garrett does not have that authority either. And Lincoln Riley, you think he's going to come in? First of all, as, as his predecessor, Bob Stoop showed, you can stay in Norman for 20 years if you're winning at a quality clip. OU's won five straight Big 12 championships. Lincoln Riley as a head coach has never not won the Big 12 championship game. He's been, every year he's been the head coach now, he has been in the college football playoff. He's got two Heisman Trophy winners, two number one picks to his ledger. Uh, do you really think that he doesn't have the ability to stay there forever? For, at OU, as long as he wants. If he wants to be there 20 years, he can be there 20 years. If he wants to go to the pros, he can do that pretty much whenever too because he's going to have that sustained success at Oklahoma. But if he comes here, if he comes to the pros, first of all, he'll have like a three to four year window to turn anything around. Now, you could argue maybe coming to Dallas, as we saw with Garrett, he got, although I would argue that's because of his personal history, he had a much longer leash and a much longer um, tenure than he had any business doing, than he would have had anywhere else. Maybe he'd have a little bit longer tenure as well, Lincoln Riley would. But if he comes in, it's not like he's just adopting all those players and saying, all right, well, Dak's my guy, Zeke's my guy. I'm sure he'd be very happy with Dak and Zeke. I'm just saying the parts he has, that's great. But there's a bunch of other parts he would want to change out. And we are locking in so many guys to big contracts now, it becomes difficult to really work with that. So you have that on one hand. If you look at Urban Meyer... The guy knows how to win, but he's a scumbag when it comes to actual character. Like, there's a reason why Florida for years led the NCAA in, like, most arrests among college programs. And then, magically, he leaves Florida and it changes. Oh, he goes to Ohio State. Oh, look at that. Ohio State now leads. He's looked the other way with domestic violence issues in the past within his own coaching staff. Like, he's done a lot of shady, shady things and it's just a situation where 
I don't know, like bringing him in, he's a great coach, but you're going to have to deal with a lot of questionable, really sleazy stuff that he does as well. And I just don't, I'm not going to be excited about that, but as a coach, he could help this team. And he's Zeke's obviously coach, recruited him and all that. So there's some connection there, but I, I don't know, man. I'm just not, not a fan of it. I don't know what the answer is at head coach. There are candidates we can talk about. Uh, Chris Peterson's out there. That was obviously, um, for a long time, the Boise state head coach. And then he was with Washington. He recently left Washington. Uh, he was the court or excuse me, the coach for our offensive coordinator now, Kellen Moore. And so there's familiarity there. Cause that's the other thing too. Uh, Jerry will not want to change out much of this coaching staff. I just don't think. And unless you can get that forced into your contract, cause if Lincoln Riley's coming in, he's not adopting these guys. Hell no. He might take on like one or two of them, but as far as like offensive coordinator, first of all, Lincoln Riley's going to want to call the plays, but you'll still have an offensive coordinator. And that's going to have to be someone he picks. He's not going to come in here and adopt a guy. It's not going to be like when the Cowboys hired Wade Phillips, but they hired Jason Garrett, not only as the offensive coordinator first, but as the head coach in waiting before they even interviewed Wade Phillips and the rest of the head coach candidates. You're not going to have that. He will not play by that game. And I don't know what that answer is for the head coaching carousel. We'll have plenty of time to get into that. I've been off in the wilderness enough on this discussion as is. The point is, I am like all of you Cowboy fans, all of my fellow Cowboy fans, I am beside myself with frustration with this team. It's at the point now where I almost welcome the implosion only to 1,000% close the door on the Jason Garrett era and to get a better draft pick because we've got our first round pick this year. We have it again. So you might as well go get something. And if we're getting a new head coach, okay. I'd like my new head coach to have and be able to use a quality number one pick to get something. So we'll see, man. We'll see. Uh, That's, that's going to do it. I'm DDP. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas prospect. And until next time, remember every legend was once a prospect. Salute.